that uh, bridges the gap between the professionals who get to have a lot of fun in this trade and those who are really powering the ship, the, the citizens, the leaders, uh, and others uh, who take part in that. I've been building this presentation for over a month. I kind of, because I knew uh, your communities pretty well, uh, that allowed me to then, while I got here, and listen to you to mostly fine tune, maybe pick a few more topics, things like that. And, and I will say, uh, uh, rather humbly, I may, I'm, I have friends who say, you may be the most traveled person in North American history. And uh, it's probably true. I've worked now in 3,800 communities. Uh, I've had uh, projects where I did four communities a day uh, for a whole week. And uh, one community, or one uh, uh, project I had uh, in uh, western Montana, we handled 14 neighborhoods in one day. Uh, in fact, what they did is they rented an airplane and we meet with people at the, at the airports and it was kind of fun. Uh, but I think I've got the best job in the world. I, I really feel that. Uh, but I've also got to work with the best people. Uh, Josh is with me. Well, Josh, stand up. Yeah, there you are. Is with the big well. And, uh, but now Luna and Mike Wilson, uh, you guys, uh, really have great talent here. You really do. And, uh, and I expect to see many great things happen over time. I also got a chance to meet some of your volunteers. These are folks who are taking care of your trails, right? Uh, I'm sure there are others, but this was a treat. But then, to go on the walking audits, and I'd like to share, I need to stand uh, where I'm not blocking people. <laughs> um, but but I, we couldn't believe how many people showed up. And it's just phenomenal, the number of people, right? Um, and I would say for a Saturday and for a Sunday, these are the largest groups in world history. <laughs> it was all the sandwiches. Yeah. <laughs> now, I'm going to ask you a question. Think back to your childhood. When you were eight or ten years old, unassisted by an adult, how far could you roam? Anybody? By far. How far? Uh, probably like ten miles. Like ten Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm going to show you a map that uh, uh, shows the, uh, what happened during our recent history. Yes, I'll, I'll move to the side. Thank you. So the uh, great-grandfather, George, at age 8, in 1919, was allowed to walk six miles to the kitchen. That was common back then. Uh, the grandfather, Jack, age 8, in 1950, was able to walk about a mile to his favorite woods. Go up to the top, uh, Vicky, uh, the mother, uh, age 8, was allowed to walk one half of a mile to her swimming pool now her son, Ed, is only allowed to walk to the end of his block, about 300 feet. Where is it? Oh, well, that's in England. But I, as I show this audience, I say, yes, that's what happened here. And uh, we want to get that back. We want walking to become something that everyone gets to do. Uh, but I'm going to tell a few stories as, as I make this presentation. One of the uh, states I do a lot of work in is Hawaii. Uh, this is Maui. And uh, this is uh, a sign that says to walk. <laughs> but no one's walking. No one's bicycling. Uh, everybody's stuck in their cars at this intersection for 20 minutes. And the reason is not because we don't have sidewalks or we don't have the bike lanes. is we don't have a system. And so until you have a whole system for walking and biking, uh, we're going to end up in traffic snarls that could take 20 minutes to get through. When I was still in high school, Jane Jacobs wrote her famous book, The Death and Life of the Great American Cities. How many of you read Jane Jacobs? Okay. Uh, that's your homework assignment, by the way. Uh, go out and 
find a copy of Jane Jacobs' Death and Life of Great American Citizens. And you will be inspired. Uh, Jane figured it all out, uh, again, when I was still in high school. And uh, so I became the first bike coordinator in Florida. And I found fairly quickly that if we wanted people to have a lifestyle that involved walking and biking, then we had to have narrow streets. And we had to have short blocks. 200, 300, 400 feet. Uh, we had to have great plazas, places to go to. And likewise, beautiful buildings and limited parking. And I can defend every one of those, and I will as we go through the presentation. Oh, by the way, who laid out and built Key West? Pirates. Pirates! <laughs> On average, how many years of college did they go to? <laughs> right? They, they basically use common sense. Why would you put a destination for people way beyond walking range? And uh, so this is the route into Key West. This is the uh, new part, the part that our generation built. And notice the streets don't drain. And uh, they're not maintaining their seawall. And uh, if you get off this bus, where are you going to go? Right? And uh, best bet is went to Cuba. <laughs> my, my suggestion is this was built by college graduates. And we can do better. We really can. Uh, anyway, so the walking audit, uh, which is a tool that I absolutely love, uh, really allows us to collectively see where we're going, and see where we might want to make some changes over time. So tonight, uh, among the topics I'm going to address is what is a walkable community? That's a really important one. What are the benefits uh, for health, for economics? And uh, how do we combine land use with transportation? And then uh, a couple other uh, topics that will help us get there. But I also want to put a certain uh, priority uh, to us doing this now. We really need to develop a sense of urgency because we just basically like the frog in a pot of water uh, with the heat going up, frog not jumping out. Well, how much more heat can we take, right? Or the conditions we've created. So I'm going to show you two beakers. On the left is what we have been measuring. And the beaker on the right, what we have not been measuring. And if we want vital, healthy, wonderful communities that we're in love with, we've got to move more toward the beaker that we want, right? And uh, if we're to do this, there's a fairly simple principle, and that is stop overbuilding for the car and start building for people and place. Basically, where you spend it. By the way, folks, in the back, uh, we do have seats up front, uh, if you'd like to sit. Because we're going to be here for 16 hours. <laughs> okay. Uh, first of all, uh, what we build determines uh, what mode we choose. So, uh, wherever we are, uh, we're needing to respond to that environment. This happens to be uh, a, a nice multi-use trail and uh, it's in the upper range in Colorado. There are many streets, uh, I live on one, that doesn't have sidewalks and never will. Uh, we own a steep grade and we just could never uh, build a sidewalk that would work. But we need places that are inviting, welcoming, comfortable. I want to introduce the help with just this one image. Notice that uh, our, this, this is very well researched. But by our genes, uh, that controls 20% of our health. How long we live, how well we live. Uh, but the other 80% is up to us. If we build the kind of environment that's very inviting, very welcoming, that uh, we have active transportation, then we're going to be much, much healthier, all of us, right? Uh, I've lived, as I said, uh, 
graduated in, in high school in the early 60s, 62 to be precise. But I saw this chart and I said, this is, this is a good chart. Uh, notice that's peak happiness. And I'm here to remind you it happened in the 60s. Right? <laughs> and, uh, uh, but this is what the 60s looked like. <laughs> now, the same place today looks like this. And it's one of the most uh, loved parks in America. Indeed, it's considered the very heart of America. It's in New York City, and, uh, and I love to go to Bryant Park every time I get. Now, how did it change? They just took a simple concept. Uh, the edge had earlier had been poor. Now they built a really dynamic edge that people can look over and feel part of and want to join the activity. So that's how important an edge is. We'll talk more about edges later. So. My recommendation is stop uh, building what we are building and start building what we value. Declare what you care about and then make sure your budgets are allowing you to achieve that. A really good friend of mine from Australia uh, sums it up this way, that there's one big reason why we build cities in the first place, for trade for exchange. But it's more than the exchange of money, it's the exchange of ideas, knowledge, passion, uh, the very essence that brings a people together. And we did not build cities to maximize transport. Transport happens when you pay attention to all the other details. Uh, so a term that is now being used is to complete our streets, to get them right. And in this case, I like to use this image that on the left-hand side is industrial uses. On the right-hand side, residential. And notice we also have utilities on the left. It's the bike lane that saves the sidewalk because it creates a buffer, correct? Um, and so both sides work, and both sides are complete, but they are different, and they need to be different. On the right hand side, the sidewalk is set back. We have green infrastructure. And then of course we have parking. All those things are important to that side of the street where they were totally unimportant to the other side. I live in Port Townsend, Washington. This is a town that's fairly close. It's called Squim. And uh, notice the elements. Uh, I am a strong proponent of raised medians. That really tames a, a street quite, quite a bit. And it uh, makes the road safer, much safer. Uh, about 71% of all fatal crashes go away if you use medians and bring the speeds down and keep the sight lines open. Uh, notice we have a detached sidewalk here, uh, or I'm sorry, detached here, attached here. Uh, and again, block by block, we often need to make adjustments, but as a composite, this is a really great street. It uh, is ab absolutely stunning. Santa Cruz, California, did a road diet. That is, they took away lanes they did not need, and uh, they were able to widen the sidewalks, put in the bike lanes, put in the, uh, the uh, buffers, the, what we call the planter row, narrow the travel lanes, narrow the two-way uh, center, and they dropped their crashes dramatically by going away from a four-lane road. One of the towns I've been able to work in for over 20 years now is this one. It is Albert Lee, Minnesota. The Minnesota DOT was going to resurface all of this road and put it right back as multiple lanes, four lanes. But we had been working in that community long enough that the community said, no, you're not. Uh, spend your money somewhere else in somebody else's community if you can't do it right. Minnesota DOT said, no, it's our street. We're going to do it our way. But the, the community, fortunately, uh, held the ground. They took away the unnecessary lanes and uh, were able to 
convinced the Minnesota DOT that this was good. Their crisis came down 73%. Now people can get across the street, they can build their buildings, and so on. Uh, so this is really what we're talking about. So what are the principles? Uh, first and foremost, if you're going to walk or bike, 60% uh, of all Americans say they would walk or bike if they were given this level of traffic stress. And you can see the designs. But if the road reads this way, they'll choose not to walk. Only a small percentage of people will walk if you don't do what people like. Same is true of bicycling. Uh, again, all Americans, about 60% said they would bike or uh, get around as much as they can by bike if you gave them a high level of quality, level of traffic service uh, is low, stress is low. Uh, and I think that's true with everyone here. Am I right about that? It's uh, pretty, pretty clear. So, if we're going to induce walking, we need some other things other than a cycle. Uh, you don't see anyone walking here, correct? What, what, what would you put in to get some people to come? Sidewalks and crosswalks, right? Uh, but notice there still aren't any people. What else would you put in? Ice cream puffs. Ice cream probably would do it, yeah. Uh, you green it up. You make it into a real park. Uh, but I still don't see anyone in that park. What else do you need? And this is critical. You need buildings to front the park and watch over the park. You need eyes on the places people want to come to. They want to be watched over, correct? So that's how simple and how complex walkability is. Uh, this is a bridge I got to rebuild. It's in Olympia. Uh, notice how the, the pedestrians felt before. Or bicyclists, you don't even see a bicyclist. But we rebuilt it. And uh, with a lot of love, this is now a place many people come to many hours a day uh, just to see the end of the Puget Sound at their community. So what are some of the ways we uh, enhance walkability and bicycling? In bicycling, uh, we not only have the bike lane, but we put in buffers. And now we feel separated from car doors and moving traffic. and. Uh, uh, many of these can be done by removing a lane of traffic when it's not needed. Uh, you can move the parking out and uh, put in a, a true protected bike lane. And then uh, we can also wholly separate uh, bicyclists with multi-use trails. Correct? So uh, we've now had easily a 15, maybe a 20-year history of doing the cycle tracks or the protected bike lanes. Many cities now have them. And, uh, and I think you see the, the advantage. Uh, MIT in the upper left and other areas of Cambridge, lower right, uh, Toronto and Winter Park, Florida, just some examples, but they're everywhere. Missoula, Montana, where I went to college, uh, you can see they did a road diet. They took the road down to essentially uh, three lanes, and that gave them enough space to put in the protected bike lanes behind the parking, right? It's at the same level as the cycle. But at every intersection, they bring people back. Uh, we also need to get people across the street. This one's done extraordinarily well. This is a rectangular rapid flash beacon, and it detects the presence of a person who's going to walk or bike across and uh, notify the motorist that this is happening. I love this one in Davis. Uh, notice the bicyclist is forced to look both ways. Then they have a median where they, where they can pause and continue. Uh, so again, we need to get people across the street when we design. Let me move into another area completely, land use. The reason people drive so much is we force them to with our land use decisions. 
Uh, we, can, and we can and we must change that. And this is why I say that how we build the neighborhoods is absolutely vital as to whether or not we can walk or bike. Uh, this is referred to as a 15-minute neighborhood, which basically means if you live in the neighborhood, most of your weekly needs can be met in your neighborhood. Parks, schools, uh, worship centers, uh, sometimes employment, and, uh, um, and so on. I'd like to use this as an example. On the right, we have conventional. That's what we've been building a lot of in the last 30, 40, even 50 years. Notice if your child wants to play soccer, you're needing a four automobile trips because of the way you design. But over on the left-hand side, what we're now promoting, we call this uh, traditional, then uh, you have really well-graded street patterns. Uh, a child could walk or bike. You could drive them there, but why? And, uh, and uh, your internal trips are captured on the left-hand approach versus the right-hand. A community that I'm totally in love with, I would move there in a heartbeat if if they had enough land for my wife to garden. <laughs> they don't, so we don't move there. Uh, but look what they've done. Uh, this is in Portland. Uh, it's, it's a fairly small area. I'll start with the, with the commercial area. This is a French department store. It's called Target. <laughs> and then you see the, uh, the center, the Bon Pop retail. And then uh, the civic uses, library, post office, uh, city hall, uh, moving uh, uh, further out, a place for employment where you can have offices, and uh, then uh, a school that actually serves four quadrants, not just this quadrant, uh, which is just beautiful and are right next to the woods, and uh, nursery, uh, other uses, uh, where they should be placed. This is very interesting to me. There's no high traffic because of all the entries and exits to the neighborhood. So we, we don't build the traffic in one uh, area where we have to widen the road. And also, uh, trails, connectors. So you would find it more convenient to walk or bike in your community if you're going to any other destination. And most people do that. They also did something I love, uh, pocket neighborhoods, very small neighborhoods, parks. And by making them small, it really uh, uh, allows people to be within a walking distance of a park. If a park is within 800 feet of a person's home, they own the park. They watch over the park. And uh, so they've done, they've done what I really highly recommend. Now another concept in land years is to build buildings uh, like this one. This is in Monterey. And it's a, a very nice building, but it only takes up one third of one acre. Many houses are bigger than that, right? And uh, in that uh, building, you, you have a uh, shoe store, a delicatessen, a restaurant, a coffee house, a six screen movie theater. Wow. And on the outside, you also have a tarot card reading shop in your own neighborhood, right? <laughs> now, upstairs, uh, two floors of studio apartments. First priority uh, goes to uh, affordability. In, in their case, they, uh, they want to hire and keep uh, good government workers. So they give first priority to anyone who works in the government uh, and give them a place uh, where they can afford. So. Josh lives near this uh, uh, open lot, uh, used to be. It's one of the great parks in Davis, California. And I uh, notice uh, it's about ready to go into construction. Once it was completed, you, oops, yeah, once it was completed, you can see it's nine dwelling units, very tastefully done to fit in with a lot of the single family, residential stock, and so on. And this now brings in enough added tax base that it more than pays for the maintenance of the park. So 
Infill investment is very important if we're going to have walkability, right? Now let's talk about how we connect our communities. Which U.S. president laid out this community? Which U.S. president? George Washington, who was a surveyor, who we're told never got past eighth grade, but he used common sense. And notice how he aligned the uh, streets to have a terminating vista on the water, right? And uh, it's such a simple principle, but we have sadly too often uh, uh, gone away from that. So let's say uh, your town code uh, allows a, a developer to take over the waterfront. And when you do, you have devalued every home you see in yellow. It's less accessible to the water. But on the right, which is a very simple change in code, you now have a bike trail next to the water, and all the streets terminate their vista on the water. So as you're building your your waterfront master plan, these are really key principles to keep in mind. Tampa, Florida, uh, after many decades of ignoring the waterfront, chose to now put in a lot of housing, and uh, essentially this is what they chose to do. Very smart. Every street lines up beautifully as part of their view on the water, and now all of these homes that are to be built, plus the ones further back, are worth more money and, uh, and, and a greater opportunity for people to walk and be active. I got to work on this neighborhood. It's, uh, it's in uh, uh, the uh, Los Angeles area, and it's called Loma Linda. And when the developer presented this set of plans to me, I said, you don't have enough connectivity. And so we worked on it, and I think you can see what we did. We uh, made the connections across. Uh, we made a street connection to a neighborhood not yet built, and did the same, whoops, I'm sorry, did the same uh, to the left-hand side. Uh, people thought, well, this can't work. Well, guess what? It way outsold projections. And you now have to be on a waiting list to even off, put an offer in for a house in this neighborhood, because that's what people want. They want to be able to walk and know their neighbors. So connectivity can be seen in terms of number of lines you draw. If you don't have enough roads, then you end up uh, with people not having the opportunity. The traffic's going to be too horrendous. But what if you, by town code, required a certain block perimeter so that your blocks and your total uh, level of street connectivity is going to be like you see here and so we urge communities to set the block perimeter for future development. Uh, what that will do is it will keep the speeds down. If you have enough blocks, enough intersections, the speeds are going to be lower, much lower and, and so on. But you also need destinations. So you also uh, uh, insist on a certain amount of open space, parks, greenland, uh, schools, if it's appropriate, work centers, retail, and so on. Yeah. On the right, uh, this old town, which is more historic, was laid out with good internal streets. Indeed, that's what you've got, and and uh, and it's very good. But some more recent neighborhoods are laid out. Uh, with disconnected streets, and that forces all trips down to the principal road, which then causes a problem uh, <laughs> where, where the engineers are forced to widen the highway, right? So we're now seeing that uh, we're very likely in the smart towns to go back to internal street systems, right? Target speed, one of my favorite new topics. How many of you have heard that term, target? Speeds. Just a couple? Okay. What that means is that we look at the land uses and we figure out what is the correct speed uh, for this sector of this highway. 
And in some areas, it shouldn't be more than 20, or 25, or 30. But there are other areas where it really should be a higher speed. And so we look at that. This town, Lancaster, California, uh, the downtown, the entire downtown used to be a five-lane road. The speeds were exotically high. I noticed this one's even posted at 40. The lower scene is uh, what that street became after it was redesigned for people. And the speeds now are typically 10 miles per hour. And a lot more parking, a lot more shopping, and uh, I think they're up to three quarters of a billion dollars of new buildings that have come in. So it's pretty amazing. So, uh, any guesses uh, on how fast most motors would drive with this scenario? 50. Yeah, really odd, though, right? Uh, because the road says, go fast. But what if you did this? What if you did this? Now this, are you ready for the big one? Terminate the Vista. And, uh, uh, now, the engineer uh, has done all the thinking. Now it's up to the developer and the town code to allow the street to be completed. And in this case, it's a marvelous uh, uh, achievement. And I can predict the speed would, would be under 20 miles an hour. Because that's the way the road says to go, correct? Now let's talk about the parts of the street. We can go through this fairly quickly. Because I think, uh, just from what I'm seeing, you're doing a really good job of getting the parts in. And uh, this is a brand new community in the Florida Panhandle. It's called Watercolor. Notice the sidewalk is set back. They have a planter row. They inset the parking and kept the, uh, the travel length down to 10 feet and then had a median. If I could build a brand new road, this is the way I would build it, these parts, right? We've seen this before, but now you see it with the parts, the importance of the raised medians, a triple canopy of trees, and uh, the bike lanes, the sidewalks, the turn lanes. I got to work on this project. It uh, is in University Place, Washington. Uh, University Place, Washington has no place. And no university. Uh, the city manager was almost killed in a crash on this road. This is a bad road. And so uh, we went in, we worked with the community, and they ended up uh, adding the sidewalks, the bike lanes, they took out the turn lanes, uh, put in appropriate turning locations at intersections. The crashes came way down. Uh, we'll, we'll look at that. Uh, here was as we built it, and a little bit later, about nine years, it's very green and very calming, very beautiful. It was, in fact, so beautiful that the both Whole Foods and uh, what's the other popular uh, shopping? Trader Joe's? Both came to this street and they said they would not have come to an ugly road. This is essentially what the community did. Uh, the center road is Bridgeport Way the road we're looking at. But look at what, how they're now gonna bypass. So anyone who doesn't wanna go up and be uh, stuck in traffic on Bridgeport, they now have a way to bypass that road uh, from either direction they come from. One of them's already built, the other one's soon. Uh, they also laid out their town center. This is a town that had no town center. And uh, it's now been built, and it's an amazing success because they focus on their people and their place. Let's talk about sidewalks. Um, human beings uh, take up a certain amount of space. Depends on the time of day and how much they had to drink. They might take up a little more space. And uh, if they're with a friend, they take up a little more space. We need to accommodate that. Uh, and um, uh, same with crosswalks, right? So what I'm about to show you is based on what people mean. And uh, so where would you rather walk? On the left photo or the right photo? And introduce a, a very important term, the buffer zone. 
In this case, it's both the bike lane and uh, some brickwork uh, along here. So this makes it much more desirable. These are 10 foot lengths, and uh, where this is too wide and no bar. Everybody see that? Pedestrians are always trying to communicate with us of what they would like. And uh, if that's not true, the customer will tell us, here's where you put the sidewalk, right? Not on the edge. The code that we create for our, our neighborhood streets, our local streets, uh, notice the sidewalk's too narrow, it's attached, uh, the driveways are, are not uh, deep enough, and so this is a pretty miserable place to walk, and what you find is virtually all people walk in the street. Because we didn't get the dimensions. Right. If we want to get the dimensions spot on, these are the basics. All sidewalks need to be five feet for a neighborhood. Uh, we need a shy zone uh, next to the fence so that people aren't right up against a hard fixed object, correct? And then we need the platter row. This is really a nice set of uh, criteria for building a really successful uh, street. By the way, the road is only 24 feet wide, curve to curve, and that's with parking on both sides and two-way traffic. Same neighborhood, different part. Uh, notice uh, the area I've highlighted in yellow. Uh, that's the shy zone. Uh, so the sidewalk needs to be wider because we have a higher uh, use of, of walking in this part of the neighborhood. Or we have a steep drop-off, Again, everything I'm showing you is pure common sense, but it has not appeared in our engineering guides for a long time. Um, we're starting to figure that out, we're building. This is one of my favorite streets. It used to be a five lane, a ugly five lane road, but they put the median in, and then really good edges, right? And uh, now it's just an absolute delight to, to walk through uh, Lake Street. A little more on bike trails. Uh, I think it's important to point out that uh, people of all ages and ability would like to walk and uh, ride bikes. So everything we design should accommodate a broad range of uh, uses, as you, as you see here. So. You've seen this before. I'm sorry for the redundancy, but uh, I also want to make the point about the housing watching over the trail. And uh, that increases the usage of the trail quite a bit. Um, I do whole presentations just on bicycling facilities and so on, but I just want to at least drop in a little appetizer for you, right? Um, and one thing I love about trails is they create these little modules where people come together and uh, socialize. It, it's really an amazing thing. And I highly celebrate all the work that you're doing with your trails. Uh, it's, it's very impressive as an outsider. Uh, Uno was able to get us out on bikes, and both Josh and I really appreciate that to see your trails. But I think it's also important to point out that people want nature. Uh, they want forced bathing. It uh, adds to their health and their outlook on life. Uh, to be able to get out into nature. So your trail should really feature that and so on. Quickly, I want to cover economics. And with economics, um, I want you to pretend that you're living in the 1400s. Can you do that? And Galileo, Copernicus, uh, looked at this vision of what the our solar system is, and they said that can't be. Higher mathematics proves that our solar system is this. They were uh, told to either shut up or uh, sur uh, suffer through the torture chambers. So they were quiet. But uh, now, today, most people realize the solar system, based on modern mathematics, looks more like the scene on the right. Right? We 
rotate around the sun. The sun does not rotate around us. But I'm going to prove <laughs> something even sillier. <coughs> what if the economy doesn't focus around the other? Uh, what if instead it focuses around people? The towns that have figured this out are turning out to be very prosperous. And they're attracting folks. Uh, a, a town that can get rid of some of their automobiles. Uh, and let's just make up a number, 15,000. If you could do that, this is how much more money is going to stay in your community. It doesn't go to Detroit, doesn't go to Toyota, right? Uh, it stays right uh, where you live and uh, helps with employment and so on. And it's also true of tourism. Uh, with the completion of the Redwood Trail, you're going to see that you are going to become a real hot spot. People will want to come here and start their trip, or they're going to want to end their trip here, uh, or whatever. And people are going to want to live here uh, to have access to the great trails you're about to build. I meant to put this with the university place. You can see what the town did. They built, uh, they bought the strip center. It was actually doing fine economically, but they knew you could do better. And you can see in that same place, they built their new town center. Uh, a lot of great housing, shops, libraries, city hall, everything. And they increased the value of their land 800%. So the more we mix the uses and get all the right elements in, uh, the, the lighter tax uh, base we're going to be uh, having to face. And here's the proof. Portland, Oregon, uh, between 1980 and 1990, was able to drop their taxes 29%. And if you look over the chart, Atlanta, which took an all-car growth policy, they had to raise their taxes 22%. That's a huge difference in, in what people end up paying in taxes because we either do or we don't build for people. Build for your car, you're going to end up paying for it. I love this chart too. If you put, invest a dollar into walking, you're not paying 100%. Community has to pick up a penny. If it's a bicycle, the community picks up eight cents for your dollar. For transit, it's a dollar fifty. But if you drive a car, and if that's your only way of getting around, society has to pay nine dollars and twenty cents for the one dollar that you put in. So it's it's just basic uh, economic sense. I want to introduce some of the tools that we talked about on our walks, including keeping your intersections compact. Don't make the lanes wider than they need to be. Don't add more lanes than you really, truly need uh, to handle the uh, traffic. I love these little pro uh, uh, meeting uh, corners. They slow down the speed of the motors, and they help protect uh, pedestrians. And you can see we've got them on all corners here. This may look a little too scientific. Um, I apologize for that, but this is what engineers love. And uh, notice the standard intersection. This is how much energy goes into that intersection. That is cars going in and circulating. With a roundabout, uh, we bring the speed way down, and we make this a much more efficient intersection. This is the potential for a crash. See the difference? It's huge. So Davis, California, again, we're going to use Davis as a great model, uh, is doing two ramps per corner. You're doing that on many of your intersections, but really all your intersections should have two ramps per corner and as wide as a crossing. Boulder, Colorado, uh, wanting to get their children to school safely, is adding the curb extensions, right? See the curb extensions? And the median island, so the students have very minimal uh, exposure. Uh, one 
easy recommendation we make to your communities is use high visibility crossings. They, they're 10 times more easy to detect than if you'd use, use two parallel lines. You can also rebuild intersections. Many ways to do it. Uh, this is uh, just a photomorph, but it's what I think uh, would really power up the neighborhood, right? Make it a place. Now you see the little median and also the little uh, median nose, as well as the powerful crossing. The next step up from that is a protected intersection. Uh, Utah, uh, especially Salt Lake and Provo, are building quite a few protected intersections. Canada is way ahead of us in building them. And, uh, but you can see how much easier it is as a pedestrian to cross, and also for a bicyclist to go through the intersection. Now, one of my favorite topics, stop building the kinds of intersections that kill people. If you build roundabouts, you reduce the number of conflict points, you reduce the speed, you reduce the angle of incident, and for that reason, 90% of all fatal crashes disappear. 70% of all crashes, uh, injury producing crashes disappear, and 50% of all crashes disappear. And you can see why, you know, uh, people can't handle uh, 32 conflicts in an intersection, but they can handle one at a time. If you are wanting to power up your intersection, you have to add right and left turn lines. Look at how wide that uh, crossing is. Oh, and by the way, today, uh, we walk through the longest crosswalk in the history of the world. <laughs> uh, we ask you to go out and find out where it is, but it happens to be in our gate. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, in August, I'll be going back to Hamburg for another visit uh, to put in two more roundabouts. Uh, on our first visit, we put in four. Their prices came down a lot. But here's the cool thing. The speeds came way down. So did the noise. And the net result is uh, people are in love with their roundabouts. They're love my gardens for them. And this is a road that carries very high freight. Uh, uh, it's amazing. Uh, if you want to take lanes out, you have to pay attention to your intersections. So in Asheville, they had the four lane road you see up uh, toward the top. And it was very dangerous. They had lost a couple of their staff going from the parking lot to their county building. But we knew the nexus, the area we had to treat was this intersection. This is end up what we did. You can see the road that is in place. Uh, pedestrians now only have to cross about 14 feet at most. And uh, uh, this area has now become very green and very well loved. So again, you can see the before and the after. But the solution was to fix the intersection. We still had to move traffic. But we only needed one lane in, one lane out, in order to make that work. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Gridley, California. Uh, we did the analysis. Uh, if we had the permission to take out five signal sets, uh, we could have gotten the traffic through town uh, uh, better, faster, at a lower speed. Does that make sense? Uh, in less time, at lower speed. Uh, they didn't go for it, so uh, their main street is suffering, and, and certainly Route 99 is suffering, because they just wanted to use the old conventional signals, which just don't uh, provide the same level of service. You can see it here. They want to do a pedestrian overpass. It was already funded by the legislature. Uh, we went in and explained to them, we can fix this intersection at half the cost of trying to get pedestrians to go up over the highway, which they won't do, right? Uh, so again, you can see it. Again, this is a, uh, 
wonderful bicycle treatment, walking treatment, and now allows buildings to come uh, and service the, the university. On a side street, the pedestrian's exposure is only this. And, uh, and that's pretty remarkable. Uh, the, uh, notice there's a rectangle of rapid flash beacon that's not being used. Often pedestrians won't go out of the way to push a button. Now, the big one for tonight, uh, calming the traffic. And here's where we've often gone astray. Uh, engineers were tasked to come up with forgiving design. The motors is acting very stupid, so let's take out the curves. Uh, let's wide, uh, widen the travel lanes. Let's do all these things you see on the left hand side. That is shifted. The Federal Highway Administration, among others, is saying we uh, are going to uh, go away from forgiveness and go to slowing the streets. And everything we do to slow traffic is going to save lives. And it's being proven in all streets that are doing this. So you saw this earlier. But one of the things that engineers are often asked to do is to figure out what 85% of motors are doing and post the speed at that speed. That's changing, uh, and I'm glad it is. But I think the point is, is we want the target speed. We, sh we looked at this set earlier, correct? Yeah. So you know the answers. Ultimately, you want to get to here. And all of those bring down the speed Lancaster, we looked at that. I'm sorry for the redundancy. And now you get to see what the street actually looks like. Isn't that cool? They put the parking in the middle. They also have uh, pianos uh, to attract people to come and just play the piano. Right? Is that cool? Another city I work on, uh, uh, Purdue, or West Lafayette, is an actual city. And, um, this is only uh, an overlay, but we're saying if you have a one-way street and if the numbers crunch correctly, you only need one lane. You don't need three lanes. And uh, I know that's a big issue for you guys. Here's why that works. If you don't interrupt traffic, a single lane can move as much as 1,800 vehicles in one hour or 18,000 vehicles a day uh, for one lane. Why would you need three lanes uh, to do the work when one lane will do it? But at the intersection, you, you, that's where you actually move the traffic. So uh, this used to be a four lane road. Uh, look at all the wonderful things we're now able to do for parking, for bicycling, and walking. Seattle and San Francisco are the two cities that have done the, the greatest number of road diets. I think both cities are over 30, they've now done. And they brought the prices down at a phenomenal rate. Uh, this particular one I like to show because you can see the benefits, the multiple benefits. The motors only has a 10 foot line. The cyclist has a probably a five foot line. Look at all those drivers. It's now easier for the motors to turn in or out of a driveway. They have greater sight lines. So again, many benefits we get if we do a road diet when the numbers allow us to. In the same city, uh, this uh, street used to be three lanes. And it was 36 feet. Think how long we have to set the signal cycle for 36 feet. Now that it's only 20 feet of crossing, uh, we can move cars better with fewer lanes, correct? Uh, one of the most studied of all road diets in the country is this one. It's in uh, Orlando. Uh, you can see where the old center had been. And it's just amazing. Oh, how did that get in a second time? I apologize for this. Okay, uh, one-way streets came up on our walks and discussion. Uh, first of all, uh, the great majority of engineers are moving toward two-way streets. You get lower speeds, lower crime rates, and uh, uh, very acceptable. But there are some reasons why you put in one-way one streets. 
And again, uh, if you do them right, in this case, notice they have the parking, they're able to get the speed down to 12 miles per hour through this uh, community. But when you need one-way streets, there are many reasons to do it. You can have extra real estate for widening the sidewalks, adding more parking, creating a better atmosphere for bicycling. So it's, it's an important decision, but become informed on your decision and only put in one-way streets where they're going to prove uh, to be useful to the community. And if you do one-way streets on a walk we took today, I recommend you never go above 14 feet uh, at the entrance. Keep it narrow and make it easy for the pedestrian to get across the street. Same with driveways if, if you only need one direction. So, some quick tent making principles. Uh, the, what you see here, I call a terminating vista. So everybody get that? The vista terminates. That means the motor isn't going to go very fast. This was totally rebuilt. This is not a photo bar. This is the actual same street. And uh, we really powered up West Palm Beach as a result of the, of the remaking of the streets. Go up to a higher category street. Uh, neighborhood collectors. Uh, notice again a triple canopy. And uh, very low speeds as a result. But the lower street, which is also a collector, um, one of the folks at uh, Civic Well almost died here when visiting his sister. And uh, motors hit him, I think it was 105 miles an hour. I mentioned to many of you, I would show you this image. I love it. It is uh, a wonderful spark growth tool, uh, basically a domed uh, crossing. Very friendly. This is in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. Now, uh, this is a favorite part of mine. Uh, uh, this is Petaluma, uh, one neighbor in Petaluma. When you redesign a neighborhood, you really want to honor the history, the character, uh, everything. So look what they did. Uh, they met with people. They used similar siding on the buildings. Uh, they placed the buildings where they should. And this is a really successful adaption. And again, that's no way to Kind of the same time so. Now, for many of you, I mentioned Kevin Lynch. Kevin Lynch wrote one of the great books also at the same time that um, Jane Jacobs wrote her book. And this is what he pointed out, that if we're going to have streets people want to walk on, you need the paths, you need the edges, you need the landmarks, you need the uh, uh, nodes. I'm going to go through each of those real quickly. So paths can be a trail, a sidewalk, or a road, or a railroad, or a water. And you, you've got at least two of them here, actually three, right? Uh, one of the, the remake streets I love the most, that we took the scene on the left, oh, I'm sorry, on the right, and turned it into the scene on the right. We paid attention to every one of these elements uh, that we just discussed. In London, uh, I, I did a walk that took, uh, I think it was 12 hours, I really walked much of the city using transit. But look at this path. Now, a path should be something that really draws us in. And uh, that if, if, if we uh, say to someone, I'm going to meet you in uh, Arcata, you don't even have to say it here. You know, it's 100% location you're going to go to. Edges. Uh, really want to get this concept across. Uh, people want, need, love edges. Notice this edge, or this one. And you see how important they are? You don't just have the path, you have the whole area now celebrating the fact that you have a good place to walk. Uh, I'll go through these others fairly quickly. You've seen this image before, but uh, a district is a very important part, and each one of your neighbors is its own district and should have its own character and quality to it. Notes, probably figure out right away, that's where people come together. 
It could be a, 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 an intersection on a trail or an actual street. Oh, by the way, they did this one wrong. What did they do wrong? Yeah, if this were a one-way street, and it is, it's a back and angle part. You don't want people to be facing away from the terminating vista. You want them to be drawn in, right? Uh, this is my first roundabout. It was in Florida about 34 years ago. Uh, we were getting one pedestrian fatality every 16 months. The beach was on one side. All the housing was on the other side. Uh, I recommended a roundabout. It was the very first modern roundabout in Florida. I went back 17 years after the roundabout went in and asked the chief of police, how many injuries do you get uh, per year now? He said, Dan, we have not even had a crash for 17 years. Landmarks. These are the things, certainly in European cities, that draw me through. A, a wonderful town. Uh, you, it helps you navigate, but it's a treat. Another topic that came up, I hope this is Willow Creek. Did I get that right? It was years ago when I visited there, so I'm trying to remember. I think this is a good street overall. Uh, I'd love to go back now and see the trees and what they've done. But today we add a few more tools to that street. So parking is one of the most controversial issues you could dream of, right? <laughs> and everybody's got their opinion, but when I uh, work with the community, I say, look, how recent is your parking management study? And they tell me we've never done one, or it's 10 years old. I say, don't argue about parking until you do a parking management study. Are you effectively, efficiently uh, managing your traffic in a, in a positive way? Uh, now I'm going to show you some tools that I'm in love with. Uh, they may or may not be an easy sell in your own community, but I love back and angle parking. It is the safest way you can park a vehicle. Uh, these are in Sacramento, or in, uh, <laughs> oh shucks, Florida. Uh, the town begins with S. Uh, Sarasota. Sarasota. Thank you. Uh, they fit beautifully. The travel lane is only eight feet wide. Bicyclists can go up uh, and down that street uh, and be seen, and they can see if a person's in a car or not. So uh, you may not get away with it in your town. Try it out in a, 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 a place that you think you can, and then try to grow it from there. But otherwise, when you have the space, use 90 degree angle parking. With your base only 9 feet wide instead of parallel 22 feet long, uh, you end up with a lot more parking, a lot more efficient parking. Or use your parking as part of your traffic slowing devices, correct? I also uh, strongly uh, urge people to get rid of their off-street parking as soon as they can, as much as they can, uh, for no other reason than uh, you get so much pollution water, air, and uh, and you can see that from that image. And then when you do parking lots, and they are needed in some locations, green them up. Have a certain required amount of, of greening uh, in the formula. And uh, now I'm going to show you how not to widen your roads. And in this case, uh, this is how towns grow. You've got a little nodule of growth. And then uh, more uh, pockets evolve. So the traffic engineer wipes the road out of need. So the uh, added volume and capacity, more growth occurs. <laughs> and more. And so the road gets wide more and more and more and more. So you got to this point. And uh, McKinleyville is a good example of where you wipe the road as far as you're ever going to wipe, right? Uh, so this is a possibility that you just don't throw your hands up in the air. Instead, you do what you're about to see. So you still got the road, and you still got the buildings, those are set back, 
and uh, you green up your parking lots for sure, and then uh, you uh, invite additional growth, but look now, you've got a parallel road, right? And you can do the same on the other side up to a certain level. So don't just keep widening your roads, use your land use to allow you to, to grow in, in the way that makes sense. Does this all make sense, folks? Want to go back, okay. Uh, Marina, California. Uh, only had one space left to build a town center. The transit agency bought the land. And all they wanted to do was handle their transit hub. The town needed a transit hub, but they needed a town center. So uh, the lo local government commission that and now Civic Well went in and orchestrated. They said, this is what you want. And this is going to use up the last space you have for a town center. Why not do something different? And so they orchestrated a better way to manage their buses and uh, otherwise allow now real plaza and uh, other areas that they could grow. They could do multi-stories, just three stories. Uh, it was up to the community. So with that, let me see where we are. I want to come to my closing and point out, again, one reason I really love your communities, you get this. You've got to raise the tide of all people in your community at the same time. Leave no one behind. Use uh, an, an informed consent style process. Come to meetings like we're doing tonight, the walking audits and so on. In uh, uh, this town, uh, up on the U.S. Uh, Canadian border, Sault Ste. Marie, they, uh, you see the mistake they made, right? There's only a sidewalk on the school side. There's none on the side of all the housing. The Michigan DOT realized that this was a mistake, so they went in and offered to build the sidewalks. 300 people came to the meeting, all of them, to kill the sidewalk. They wanted to look rural, and to them, the sidewalk was urban. So we've all got to come together and understand what it is we really value. Do we want our children to go out and take walks? Do we want to go out and take walks and uh, not suffer having to get across the street like this in order to do that? And uh, kind of finally, uh, what we built up until now was fairly straightforward. We used to use our standard engineering, sometimes forgot the common sense. But now, if we're to go to rebuild a community, like we did in Waikiki, we were asked to come in and orchestrate a team. Uh, we have to figure out what are the parts that work? What are the parts that don't work? How do we get freight uh, to agree to a different way of delivering to the hotels and the restaurants? Uh, otherwise, we can't, we can't add to the success. Of a place. So, very complex. I'm going to close with this image. It's, it's my, well, no, I think there were one or two more. Um, I was asked by my mentor, Ramon Trias, to go to Barcelona. He said, Dan, this is the most walkable city in the world. And I got there, took lots of photos, and uh, this one puzzled me. So I went back to Ramon. I said, Ramon, what's going on here? And he, he laughed. Uh, kept smiling. He said, Dan, you discovered the secret to Barcelona. They have architects, engineers, planners, landscape architects taking children out on walks. And they're teaching the language of the city. And by doing that, when they become the, uh, the elected leaders or the voters, they're going to vote for the right things because they know what's critical to their community. Uh, I was in uh, Bend, Oregon, and saw this school teacher uh, with her children. They'd stop and they draw. And they move on and they stop and they draw. So I went up to her and asked, and I said, what are you teaching the children? And she said, we're teaching the children how to make a beautiful city. And I'll close uh, with, with my favorite slide. Don't worry. Uh, essentially, uh, folks, uh, uh, the people who came before us 
Uh, we're not well informed. They just did things that were necessary. But this is the generation that's going to bring the change and really power up a place you're always proud of that's beautiful and you show great pride and so on. So I truly appreciate the opportunity to come and speak before you. And uh, I think we're going to leave a little bit of time for some questions and answers. Thank you.
Um, so one of the ways to do that is with a pedestrian activated rapid flashing beacon. And I'm wondering, um, and I mean pedestrian activated ones, not, I mean, uh, oh wait, I think I'm saying one thing, hybrid ones that actually have a stop, that actually make the car stop only when a pedestrian is there. Um, so my question to you is, have you seen those work um, where a pedestrian can actually stop the traffic so that they know that they've got a safe uh, crossing over that roundabout. We're looking at building a really big one right near our uh, university, so I'm real concerned about students and staff and people moving around. <coughs> um, so, if you could, thank you. Uh, absolutely, um, when engineers get it wrong, that they're just trying to move traffic as fast as they can, we end up with a, a backlash. Uh, Oak Park, uh, Michigan, or let's say Oakland County, Michigan, had this, uh, criteria for their roundabouts that made it impossible for people with visual acuity issues to cross. Uh, a, a town I uh, went to in Ohio, Gahanna, Ohio, did the same thing. A woman who was totally blind uh, came to me and said, Dan, can you show me how I can get through this two-lane roundabout? We went there, me with very bright uh, uh, fluorescent vests, she with a guide dog, and we could not get a single motor field to us. It was that bad with design. Uh, we must get our designs that work for all people all the time. And sometimes we can do that with added treatments, like a rectangular rapid flash beacon that uh, does activate. We're building a, a brand new one in our town, and that's one of the many treatments we're adding to it to make sure we get total compliance by the motors. So uh, we're in that era of inventiveness, but the, the, we've got great engineers that are figuring out what tools we have to add for the special needs of people. Kind of answered my question. Oh. <laughs> what was it about? I've been told that visually impaired people have difficulty navigating the roundabouts. Those you know, yeah. designs. So that, that is true. But I can say, on the other hand, uh, people who have visual acuity issues have problems at every intersection. And, and it's a very tough position to be in. Uh, we built the first roundabout in Vermont, and uh, and not only does it work beautiful for the school children, in fact, principals from other states come to study that first roundabout, but a uh, woman who is, uh, again, 100% uh, blind, says that she could never cross that intersection safely when it was signalized that the motors were coming through too fast, we've got quieter cars today, uh, many reasons, but ever since the roundabout was built, she's never had a problem crossing. Now, two lane roundabouts are very different, and we need a lot of additional tools to make them work.
that you will only go at a certain speed. And when we design the streets, we're going to tell you that you don't want to go more than 20. Uh, and that's true of all the towns in Humboldt County. Uh, I would say the same should be true in every school zone. Never should people be driving more than 20 in any school zone. It just doesn't make sense. And uh, for progressive communities, we don't see enough of them yet in the US, but we're seeing them in Canada, is in local street networks, in neighborhoods, 20 is 20. And uh, I live on the street. I'm very happy to live on the street, I do. The paving is only 15 feet wide. Two-way traffic, walking, biking. Again, we have no uh, sidewalks. And I love living on that street because I know my neighbors. Uh, people behave. I see two or three times as many people walking and biking as I know people driving. So we need to get the categories of our streets to behave the way they are really meant to be. Local streets only for access. Never for speed. Collector streets, only up to a certain speed that still works where motors want to yield. Then we get to the big streets like Broadway. Uh, now we need to introduce the tools that start to bring the speeds down. Uh, when we went out and looked at it, we were seeing speeds of 40, even 45 miles an hour. The zone we were in, the set of blocks we were in, the speeds shouldn't be more than 30. So we need to put in the tools to get the motors to uh, drive the correct target speed for where that street is. Further out, um, maybe 45 miles an hour is fine, but not where you have stacks of restaurants and motels and, and neighborhoods that don't deserve that kind of uh, crashes. about Arcadia in New York. Um, he was talking about K Street, that we, when we took our walk in Arcadia, it was K and 11. Oh, okay. K and 11. Okay. <laughs> so that might be just all information. Yeah, I'd love to look at the set of plans. I really would. I, I deal well when I can see all the treatments going in. And uh, I do a lot of peer reviews around the country. So I'd love to do that so I can authentically I give you ideas that I think is work. Okay. If it helps, um, K Street is an arterial through a commercial and residential district. Does it start from the waterfront? Um, no, this is our case. Oh, yes. Yeah. So it will be going. The city, the city, yeah, the city. Okay. Oh, so, uh, yeah, the city wants to turn K Street into one way, um, and they want to turn L Street, which is partial. Okay, there's K Street. Yeah. They want to turn L Street one way, the other way, but it only exists for a few blocks. But L Street is where the trail is. Right. Um, and again, we're in the part of your community where the speed should be very low. Uh, so very frequently we put in whatever we do at the intersections and uh, what we even do mid-block should help hold the speeds down. And so uh, I'd love to see plans and, you know, comment further. Yeah? It has been a lot, a lot of resistance. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's, just to, just kind of we got other people ready to ask questions. So thank you. Very, thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, um, oh, um, sure. Thank you so much. Um, I guess to bring it back to the roundabouts, and we'll never leave the subject. Um, so I guess when it comes back to roundabouts from like a cycling perspective, um, most modern design and the designs that you see throughout a lot of the cities kind of either expects cyclists to enter the roundabout like a car would or to go along the sidewalk. Um, there usually isn't a lot of signage directing cyclists in either of these directions. Um, and it's really kind of an uncomfortable situation for even experienced cyclists to enter that 
roundabout, um, especially for somebody who's maybe trying to take a child or um, an older an older person who's trying to get you know back out on the road. Um, in situations where you don't really have enough right away to to put a roundabout with proper bicycle facilities, or I guess what even bicycle facilities in a roundabout look like when they're kind of optimized, um, would something like a protected intersection serve serve a better purpose for kind of those multi-use intersections where they're thinking of putting roundabout, but they're just wanting the bikes to enter and the rest of the traffic. Thank you. Uh, what we recommend is that each state, each community adopt a roundabouts first policy, which means they look at it and they try to figure out if that is the best choice, and if it is, that should be built, because it's so much safer, so much more capable of carrying the traffic and so on. Uh, but when we design, we always design for bicycles. And so I consider myself a competent bike rider, and when I can bring the speed of the motors down to my speed, I would never go around uh, the uh, sidewalk, right? But let's say later in the day, I've got a grandchild with me, I'm not gonna go straight through the intersection. So I think it's a choice that people make, but uh, we've built strings of roundabouts, like, uh, uh, Burk Rock, California, I think we have seven now, and we brought the speeds down to about 19 miles an hour. And for me, as a competent cyclist, I wouldn't want to go around, but again, if I had a, a child with me or my family with me, whatever, I would definitely use the ramps and the wider sidewalk for that purpose, and then come back in on the other side. So, it, yeah. It, we're going to get there. Uh, we're, we're all trying to figure out how to best treat anyone who's going to come and use a roundabout. And by the way, in that string of roundabouts, uh, it's La Jolla Boulevard, uh, we brought the noise level down 71%. It's just amazing what that's done for businesses in the area. Yeah. Thank you. I was wondering, is there a maximum diameter on roundabouts? Can a 40 foot wide two way street accommodate a roundabout? I have a second question. Uh, do you have resistance from emergency response? Uh, and if you do, how do you get past the resistance? Uh, first, uh, if, if you want to measure an intersection, for uh, whether a roundabout with sidewalks is going to fit. Uh, you measure diagonally, and you need 120 feet. 125 is better. For a multi-land roundabout, it goes up to 140 feet. Now, uh, we also recommend that if you don't have that space, uh, that you go down uh, to the, the design I showed you in Providence, it's dome. And then you can keep it, you can basically put it anywhere uh, as a dome uh, neighborhood roundabout. Uh, they also can be used on reasonably high volume streets. And again, when you get that, that unusual vehicle, freight, uh, they just go right over. Now, emergency responders, I wish I dropped the image in to show you. Uh, I was in uh, Naples, Florida at uh, one of the, our brand new roundabouts there, and a uh, fire apparatus, good size, was coming in, code three, lights, sirens, the whole works. And I said, I want to see how much we have to slow down. Because it was the previous four-way stop, by law, they have to come to a full stop before proceeding. This guy went through, I think, at 30 miles an hour. Uh, even rode over the truck we burned, and uh, should not be effective whatsoever. So in general, we've got fire marshals and fire chiefs asking to have roundabouts uh, for, for their stations or whatever. So we're seeing a lot more opportunity uh, because they get it. Uh, for them, when a big traffic queue builds up at a signalized intersection, they have to figure a way to go uh, across the road and go contra flow. Roundabout, they don't have to do that. They, they just go through and so on. 
So overall, the emergency responders get it, they, they realize the benefits, but you need to communicate with them up front. Uh, my dad was a fire chief. Um, my brother, a lieutenant. His son, uh, now a uh, EMS responder. So I come from the family of emergency responders. Thank you. I know you walked um, one on one at uh, Broadway, but have you been on 4th and 5th Streets here in Eureka? Um, they have 30 mile an hour speed limits with a, a stoplight at pretty much every intersection. I know they have them timed so if you hit the green wave, you won't have to stop, but that's where a lot of people have been killed is in those crosswalks. Sounds like I need to come back. <laughs> Right of way, and their concern is, of course, moving as many cars as possible as quickly as possible. So, okay, do we have? Do, is there one more question over here? I, I live in Arcadia. I ride a tricycle, and I have talked to Nitra about parking spaces, like around the plaza. And I want to ask you about um, parking spaces that are only car exclusive. Because parking a bicycle or a tricycle, there's limited space and places. And um, what do you think about sharing the parking spaces for bikes and cars? What we are now doing much more of is converting one car parking spaces into a bicycle corral. Uh, for, for one car parking space, you can get uh, clear up to 16 bikes parked. So it's a much better use of space. Uh, Portland is a leader, I think, in this. So um, a good place to study what they're doing. One more up here. One more up here. We're going to talk yesterday about the parking and a microphone for an area. What does it entail that? What would someone do to put together a parking map? Yes, the, the uh, idea is if you do a parking management plan, which I highly recommend, is that uh, there are firms that do nothing but parking management plans. Uh, they can lay out all the things that you would want to check off and, and do in your analysis. But you can do a parking management plan by just using a map, peak hour of parking, count how many unused spaces there are. And you're going to find, and I can almost guarantee you, that only two-thirds of your parking is being used. But you way over designed for parking. And, uh, but if you want to do a professional study, there are firms, again, that, that do nothing but parking management studies. And they do them very well. Yeah. Yes, sir? Sometimes uh, the problem is that we're used to being able to pull up and park in front of the store we're going to. And all of a sudden, there's more business, thank goodness, and we have to walk three blocks, right? And in many places, that would be nothing. But, you know, how do you get a community to change its mindset about things like corporate? Right? One step at a time. <laughs> and again, folks, we all know this. We've become so spoiled. Uh, in my own uh, town, Port Townsend, we are very popular, but the, the stupid shop owners and employees are eating up a third of all the parking. One single parking space, if it's properly managed, will help bring in $200,000 to the community. But if you got your shop owners and employees and others that shouldn't be tying up the parking, tying up your parking, you need better policies, and you need people. Uh, and I, I tell you, I met, yeah, worked in any community where they had a real parking problem. It was always a parking use problem. Uh, we met the enemy, and he and she are us, right? So, yeah, it's a hot topic. That's why I included it. But uh, I truly do recommend that we do a parking management study. If it's nothing more than a couple professionals locally uh, looking at that peak hour of 
parking need and saying, my gosh, uh, 10%, 15%, 20% of our parking is just not being used, right? Uh, or you have a church in a good location, but they are only allowing uh, their church members to park on a Sunday or a Wednesday or whatever. We need to share parking. Uh, exclusive parking is stupid, right? So, Way, way back. Yes, ma'am. Thankfully, this is thankfully this is not about my own belts. I'm I'm very curious. Have you ever been asked to work with a community that is primarily uh, people of color? Um, oh sure. And I was wondering what sort of differences you might have noticed in your attitude or planning. Over the years, I've worked with uh, a dozen uh, communities of color. Uh, Josh uh, has probably worked with over 100 communities of Hispanic uh, and uh, Vietnam uh, populations and so on. I think every community has similar issues when it comes to they want a good life for their children. They want uh, access to the things they can't get because they've been denied that. Uh, an example, there's a town you know, on Long Island, um, basically 100% black. When we worked with them, number one, we couldn't get people to come. We knew that in advance. I mean, they've been told over and over, you can't have anything, right? So we knew that ahead of time, so we worked through the churches. And we got the, the church leaders to invite people, and we packed a room with 200 people. Uh, we, we did a couple things just to enliven and get them to realize they were in a safe place. And uh, uh, it was fun. Uh, we, we changed our engagement style a little bit, but we still covered the basic needs that people had. They wanted better places for jobs. They, they wanted uh, the same services that other communities were getting. And they, they, they wanted lower speed traffic. Every town I've ever worked in is concerned about the safety of their children. Yeah. Folks, thank you.